Um, okay, so uh, we're really excited to have Paul here today uh, to talk about um, work he's done on distributional robustness, which has taken many different flavors over the, uh, I guess, five years now of his PhD. But uh, yeah, so Paul's a, a grad student at LTI at CMU working with Graham and um, I'm gonna turn it over to him. A reminder to ask questions in Dory. And if something urgent comes up, we will attempt to pause and clarify as necessary. Cool. <laughs> cool, yeah, thanks Liz. Um, and yeah, hi uh, everyone. So as Liz said, I'm Paul. I'm a PhD student at uh, LTI at CMU. And oh, wait a sec. All right. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, work I've done recently. Um, it's a paper that uh, is still under review. So take everything I say with a grain of salt, uh, but I'm really excited about it. Um, and um, yeah, let's get started. This is work I've done with uh, my collaborators, Tatsu, Tatsu Hashimoto from Stanford and uh, my advisor, Graham Newbig at CMU. So modeling the second player in uh, distributionally robust optimization. So first, uh, before diving right in, I want to talk a little bit about uh, distributional shift. Oops, all right. Um, to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, and what I refer to when I talk about distributional shift is um, usually in machine learning and in NLP, uh, we train our models on data sampled from a uh, data distribution, P, right? And then we evaluate performance on data uh, Test data sample from this same distribution P, right? Um, so we have this whole like training data, validation data, test data, everything from the same distribution. Um, and we have some like guarantees or at least idea of generalization within the same distribution. Uh, when we start having problems though, is when the test data comes from a different distribution. That's what that's what we're talking about when we say distributional shift. It's a shift um, of the test distribution from the training distribution. Um, and it's, it's not just uh, points uh, binary classification on a 2D plane, it also happens in the real world. Uh, so these are two examples I've been using uh, over the years. They might be a bit outdated uh, now, but I think they, uh, they get the point across. Are examples from uh, Facebook and Google uh, translation systems that fail in, um, in a real world setting when confronted to, with data that is not from the training distribution. All right, so... Um, Hopefully, uh, you guys are convinced, as I am, that we should uh, build models that are robust uh, to distributional shift. This is what distributionally robust optimization is all about. Um, just quickly to clarify the setting I'm going to consider in the rest of the presentation is uh, something called group DRO. And it's essentially saying the training data uh, contains a mixture of different uh, domains of different populations. Just some of them might be uh, overrepresented or underrepresented. So in that case, there are two domains, right, on the upper upper right corner, on the lower left corner, um, and they have slightly different decision boundaries. Um, but also, one of them is much um, it's uh, overrepresented. It's like a one to fifty sampling ratio. All right. So this is the kind of setting where we're going to try to train models that do well on both domains. So first, distributionally robust optimization. What is it uh, exactly? Uh, we'll start with uh, expected risk minimization or empirical risk minimization. This is everything. This is something um, I think all of you probably know about. Um, this is the standard way of training. We uh, have a training distribution P from which we sample data, and we optimize the parameters of the model theta to minimize the expected value of a loss function uh, under distribution P. And loss function can be negative log likelihood, uh, margin loss, whatever. Uh, so this is what the objective looks like. Uh, and as I've alluded to earlier already, there are some problems with this. Uh, and here's an example in the toy setting I described. Uh, this is training a linear model. So the linear model can't fit um, the data perfectly. Uh, and when you train it with expected risk minimization, it's going to focus um, much more on the overrepresented domain. And as a result, you'll end up learning models um, that have a good performance on this domain, but um, low performance on the, on the smaller domain. All right, so this is something we want to fix. 
Now, distributionally robust optimization is a fairly general framework for addressing this. And it takes the ERM procedure and makes the following changes. Instead of um, optimizing only on one distribution P, we'll actually define um, what's called an uncertainty set, which is a set of distributions, um, uh, possible domains or distributions um, on which we think our model should perform well. And instead of minimizing the expected loss under P, we're going to maximize the expected loss. We're going to compute the expected loss um, under all the distributions in this uncertainty set and minimize the max loss. So uh, when we minimize this, um, this objective, we end up having some guarantee that the model is going to be good on, um, on all distributions on the uncertainty set. As an aside, this, is, um, this becomes uh, a min-max game, a min-max optimization problem between the parameters theta and the distribution, uh, the worst case distribution Q. And I want to elaborate on this a little bit because this is a crucial difference with the usual uh, empirical risk minimization um, framework. So I have a small um, uh, metaphor here. Um, so this is regular minimization. Um, you have, this is essentially a single player game. You have the model that plays this parameter theta against the environment, uh, P, which is fixed. Um, and the model gets uh, a loss function um, as a function of the parameter theta and the distribution P, and it tries to minimize it with respect to theta. Again, this is a single player game. So it's, um, in a sense, it's easy compared to a min-max game where the model, again, plays uh, 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 parameters theta, but now the real world is able to play a distribution Q, um, choose any distribution Q within the uncertainty set. And given parameters theta and distribution Q, we get this payoff or this loss, the expected value of the loss under distribution Q. And now the model still tries to minimize this loss, um, but the real world is able to change the distribution Q and tries to maximize um, this loss in terms of Q, all right? Um, well, alternatively, uh, they both try to minimize their own objective and the two objectives are different. So you can think of uh, this uh, game versus uh, regular minimization is in games, there are multiple players and they all try to minimize their own objectives and all objectives depend on the actions of various players. All right. So this becomes a slightly more complicated optimization problem. Um, anyway, so this is um, roughly what distributionally robust is, is about. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about uh, what we both here, uh, parametric DRO. Um, first, I want to emphasize, um, and we've probably picked up on this already, that the hard, one of the hardest part of DRO is actually defining this uncertainty set. Um, in the ideal scenario, you know which domains uh, you want your model to perform well, on, and you have data on this domain, and then you can actually um, this Q is a finite set of distributions or set of data sets, and you can actually compute the maximum of this and do um, undo DRO. Um, but in practice, that's not necessarily the case. Like you don't actually know all the distributions that your model might, might be confronted with at test time. And uh, in that case, you need to define this uncertainty set with some notion of what is an acceptable domain. And that's, that's a setting we're, uh, we're going to put ourselves in uh, in, this, uh, in this talk. All right. Uh, and yeah, so the few, uh, the few uh, difficulties with choosing this uncertainty set is first, it must be large enough to contain uh, distributions that we're interested in. So if we have our data distribution Q, we need to make sure that our confusion set is large enough to include a possible test distribution Q test, all right? Um, However, it shouldn't, shouldn't be too large, right? You can't include all possible data distributions under the sun because then you might end up with data distributions that are actually um, um, quote unquote adversarial um, that represent only random noise or that are essentially too hard for any model to fit and that would derail the, uh, the, the maximization problem. Um, so it should be just the right size and that's hard enough. Uh, but there's another computational uh, consideration to take into account is, um, especially when we're doing something like gradient descent where we're iteratively getting the gradient um, of the loss with respect to the parameters. Um, here, we're trying to minimize a maximum. So we would need to compute the maximum at each step. So we take a gradient, we compute the maximum, we take a gradient step, uh, get new parameters, then compute the new maximum, et cetera. And that can be very, um, 
computationally expensive. Um, and so previous work has looked in particular at confusion sets that keep this maximum tractable. And one option is to have a simple confusion set uh, be uh, like a finite set of distributions under which we can take the max. Um, another option is non-parametric confusion sets, um, uncertainty sets where um, basically it is defined with um, as like a KL ball, um, KL constraint, something like that. And in cases like this, you can, uh, people have been able to derive a closed form solution of the maximization problem. Um, but still, this is, uh, this limits the, the design space of, uh, of possible uh, uncertainty sets because of these um, computational uh, considerations. And what we're trying to do here um, in this work is we are going to try to find a middle ground, like something that is a little bit more complex than the kind of confusion sets we can usually get, a bit, little bit more problem specific. What we're gonna do is simply can define- Paul, can, yeah. can I have a question on that previous sure. slide? Yeah. Uh, so like, what does it mean in practice for Q, for example, not to be large enough, not to be too big? What do you mean? So, sorry. Can, can but, you... Like, what does it mean in practice? Like, for example, the second point, uh, Q must must not be too large. Like, what, what does it mean in practice? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So typically, for instance, when the confusion set uh, is defined as um, KL ball, so that's saying, the confusion set is all distributions that have that are within a certain KL divergence, a certain distance of the training distribution, right? If you choose the radius of this ball to be too large, um, the confusion set is going to include uh, distributions that are like the uniform distributions over labels and things like that. Um, so that that's what I mean by the 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 set being too large. Like it contains too many distributions, including bad distributions. Does, does that no, so, so th this is still like in the theoretical uh, domain, I think. Um, like, I'm yes, asking, this like, is. Yeah, yeah, so like from a practical point of view, like how, do, what do you consider something which is like a Q which is too large? Um, well, I mean, in the, um, in practice, uh, some people have been doing DRO with, um, uh, with KL balls are con as confusion set. And then in that case, the KL, um, the radius of the ball is like, like a practical sort of hyperparameter that you need to tune uh, to make sure that the, you don't leave too much uh, freedom to the, to, the, to the worst case distribution. Um, so, I mean, when I'm saying it's not too large or, or too small, um, speaking very vaguely, but there are very concrete Examples when, in the case where the confusion set is a ball under some distance metric around the distribution, just means you need to make sure all possible, all, all distributions in the uncertainty set must be close enough, similar enough to the training distribution, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. all, right. Okay. all right. Is there, I saw something in the chat, is there another question? Um, Jason was just, I think, trying to clarify. So um, it says, uh, I think Kina refers to how do you constrain yeah. this in order to avoid getting too large a Q? Um, yeah, good question. So I don't want to get into too much details because it's dependent on uh, how you define the uncertainty set. Um, but uh, there are several ways of doing so. And one thing is, to add some constraint on the kind of distribution that you can allow in the maximum. And that can be things like making sure that the KL divergence is uh, small enough with the training distribution, or it can be things as, uh, such as making sure that um, the, the worst case distribution or the, the distribution Q, however you choose to model it, does not assign uh, more than, um, two times the probability mass that the training distribution assigns. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's very clear, but essentially it, it depends on, um, on how you choose to model the uncertainty set. And I'll go into a little bit more details um, when I talk about our method, like we have something to, uh, to enforce that. All right. um, so yeah, parametric DRO is essentially we're saying, 
we're going to define this uh, uncertainty set as a family of models. So indexed on, um, on uh, parameters. Um, so you can think of it as saying our, uh, all our adversaries, all our, um, yeah, our uncertainty set is all uh, LSTM language models um, with two layers or something like that, all right? Um, so we have the classification model theta, and now instead of having some abstract distribution, we have another um, parametric model that represents a distribution over the, over the training data. Um, and this changes the uh, min-max problem that is described above into a gradient game where we are trying to minimize with respect to some parameters theta uh, and maximize with respect to the parameters of, um, of the worst case distribution uh, psi. Uh, the, exact, um, the exact architecture uh, that we want this uh, uncertainty set to take is problem dependent. You can choose basically whatever you want. Um, in our NLP experiments later, we're using transformer models. Um, but really one of the advantage of this is, um, and yeah, sorry, in the, in the following, I'll refer to theta as the model and psi, I'm going to call the adversary because it's trying to um, be adversarial with respect to the model. Um, and yeah, I was saying one of the pros of this approach is that uh, it allows us more, um, um, a finer grain choice or more problem specific choice of the uncertainty set, we can choose uh, any kind of architecture we want. Um, and we can model more things, more complicated uncertainty sets. And the downside is it's hard to optimize and I'll go into this a little bit more um, later. Uh, one thing I'm going to gloss over because it's not that interesting, but essentially, um, this is what the loss looks like, and that's what we want to minimize in terms of the parameter of theta, and we want to maximize in terms of the parameters psi of the adversary. Um, this is th this can be risky because if we sample from the adversary, which is again a neural language model, for instance, um, if somehow we don't initialize it properly or it uh, diverges during training or something like that. Uh, we might end up sampling uh, very bad, um, very bad examples, uh, and that might derail the entire training process. So one thing we do here is instead of sampling directly from the adversary, we're doing um, important sampling. So we're sampling from data distribution, so just actually getting a mini batch of data, and we weighting the loss by the likelihood ratio between the adversary and the and the true density. Um, now we don't know the actual value of this true density p here. Um, it's um, yeah, it's generally unknown, right? So one thing uh, we do here is we make a slight change and we replace this by the probability um, density given by the maximum likelihood estimate. Uh, so you can think of this as we train a language model on the data and we use this value instead of the true value um, in the reweighting term. All right, so this is what our objective looks like. And again, we have parameters theta and we try to minimize um, with respect to these parameters and parameter psi here, we try to maximize with respect to these parameters. Um, now, how do we optimize? Um, yeah, how do we solve this problem? How do we find a min max for this problem? Um, that's actually the hardest part. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, finding the inner maximum is, is hard. And that's one of the reasons why previous work has devised uh, confusion sets that are a little bit simpler than this. Um, because essentially to find a max under the parameters of the adversary psi, you need to solve an entire optimization problem, right? So it's an optimization problem within an optimization problem. So what we're gonna do instead is we're not going to take one gradient step on theta and then solve an entire optimization problem on psi and then take another gradient step and stuff. Instead, we're going to do simultaneous gradient descent. And this is just saying at each step, we're going to compute the gradient of this loss with respect to theta and psi. And then we're going to update uh, each parameter simultaneously accordingly. And so for theta, we want to minimize so we take a negative gradient step. And for psi, we want to maximize so we take a positive gradient step. All right, uh, this is very efficient. Uh, as an aside, um, this is also what's done in, uh, at least what was done originally uh, in GANs. Um, in GANs, we have, you have a similar problem where you try to uh, 
um, minimize some loss uh, with respect to the generator and minimize another with respect to the discriminator. And um, this is usually trained using simultaneous gradient descent as well. Um, and again, simultaneous gradient descent is good because it's efficient. We only need to do one forward step, uh, one forward pass and two backward pass uh, at this time. Uh, the downside is that it's much, much harder than regular uh, SGD to, to optimize. Um, and I really want to stress this um, because I think there's a fundamental, uh, there's a fundamental difference between regular gradient descent and simultaneous gradient descent. So here's a, here's a small visualization of how that's different. Um, in regular gradient descent, uh, we're following a vector field that is uh, the gradient of some function. Uh, that's called a conservative vector field in, uh, in physics. Um, and the good thing about this is that we're always going down, right? This is descent. Um, and typically around a local uh, minima, you have a gradient field that looks like this, which means that the trajectories are going to converge to one point. Now, if you consider uh, what happens in simultaneous gradient descent, so here, consider a vector field where on one, you have two parameters um, and you're doing simultaneous gradient descent on these parameters, but each parameter, uh, their gradient is the gradient of a different function than the gradient of the other parameter. So you end up with weird vector fields like the one here, where uh, you have this uh, rotation, uh, rotational motion. Um, which can lead to cyclical uh, behavior in optimization. You can think of it as uh, when you're playing a game, um, one player uh, updates their, their strategy and now they're winning, um, but then the other updates their strategy and now they're winning and, and et cetera, et cetera. Hopefully that's not too hand wavy. Um, but concretely for us, this means that when we're doing simultaneous gradient descent, we might end up in situations like this where uh, we're, we're never actually going to stop. Um, uh, and we're going to reach these stable uh, trajectories, right? Uh, something like this. And in practice, it's not all rotational like this. You have a mixture of both, and then you end up with trajectories that look like this. You have some weird uh, spiral thing. Um, but yeah, basically, it's harder uh, than regular gradient descent. Uh, so that's the theory. Now, in practice, this is applying um, our PDRO thing with simultaneous gradient descent on the problem I described above. Uh, here, the black concentric lines, they are the... So here, we're representing the adversary is just a Gaussian uh, distribution, a normal distribution, right? Uh, the black lines is just um, corresponds to the maximum likelihood estimate. Um, and the green lines are the adversary. So as you can see, the adversary can rule, right? Um, it tries to model the worst case distribution. It sort of moves towards the towards this smaller domain here at the bottom at the bottom left, but it diverges um, and basically it doesn't work at all. All right. So hopefully I have convinced you that it is a hard optimization problem. Um, but we're not uh, giving up, giving up yet. There are a few things we can do to to fix this. And I think this goes back to the question that was asked earlier. Um, one of the problems here is the, is the adversary is able to diverge completely um, and it's not focusing on one domain or the other. It's modeling some normal distribution very far away from the actual data. And that's one of the problems, right? There's no constraint. So it's able to uh, model a distribution that is very far from the training data. So one thing we can do is add a constraint. Uh, one thing that's used often in the RO is the uh, KL divergence constraint. This is actually pretty hard to enforce in practice, um, but here in this toy setting, we have uh, an approximate, uh, we're able to enforce it approximately. And you can see um, that now it looks like this. The adversary is not able to move too far away from, uh, from its starting point. And this sort of solves the problem in some cases, but not all. There's still um, there seems some instability and it's converging to weird, uh, weird, uh, weird adversaries. Ideally, we'd want it to move towards the, towards the, the underrepresented domain, right? To assign more mass to, to, to these points. It's not doing this all the time. So the constraint thing works, uh, but there are still a few issues. 
uh, it's still a little bit unstable. And also, as I mentioned earlier, it's difficult to enforce it in practice. Um, because like, okay, here, here cube psi is a Gaussian. Uh, so it's not like it's pretty simple distribution, but when cube psi is uh, eight layer, uh, multi-head uh, transformer model, whatever, uh, this becomes really hard to actually compute and enforce this not change, right? So there are two things we're gonna to do to remedy uh, this issue. First, um, since the constraint is hard to enforce, we're going to relax it. Uh, so instead of uh, maximizing this uh, expected value under some constraints, we're just going to maximize it and then add a penalty, uh, a KL penalty here. Uh, and we can reorganize this and this the resulting objective uh, has a nice interpretation. It's actually another KL divergence between the, the adversary, cube psi, and some distribution that we call Q star, um, which is more or less equals to the data distribution P times modulated by the exponentiated loss of the model. Um, so essentially it's a distribution that assigns a little bit more weight uh, to examples that have a high loss under the model, right? Um, and here, this hyperparameter tau is the uh, is is the weight of this penalty, uh, and we treat it as high as a hyperparameter. So this is how, in our method, we sort of control uh, how close the adversary should stay to the data distribution. Right? This is how we control how big uh, the uncertainty set can be. Um, as you can see, if uh, at the limits, if this temperature parameter tau is going to infinity. Uh, this distribution Q star is going to look like uh, this term here. The exponential term is going to go to one. Um, and so this objective will just make sure that cube size stays close to, to the data distribution P. So anyway, um, the resulting objective that we're trying to maximize is the negative KL divergence. And so we're actually trying to minimize the KL divergence between those two distributions. Uh, so that's for the constraint, but there's still a problem here. Um, and it's that this optimizing the scale divergence in this direction is hard. Um, the reason why is that we're trying to minimize an expectation with respect to the parameters of the distribution. And that's a hard problem that's been, um, that's been known to be hard in, um, in, in fields like reinforcement learning. Uh, they, are, they have similar problems. Uh, when you're trying to optimize reward with respect to a policy and things like this. Um, and so one thing we do here uh, to make it easier is we're going to change the objective by reversing the direction of the KL divergence. Um, this doesn't change the global uh, optimum of this objective, right? But it's going to change the dynamics a lot. So instead of we're going to minimize the KL divergence um, between Q star and cube psi, and what's good about this is if you ignore the entropy term, it ends up being just a regular uh, cross entropy loss, which is something we're very familiar with um, in, in, in NLP um, and machine learning. And so we end up with this final loss here, um, which is kind of the log likelihood of the data, uh, but modulated by the exponential loss of the model. So we're going to try to assign more weight to learn an adversary that assigns more weight to examples that have a high loss under the model, under the, the model theta. All right. Uh, all right. So I think that's it for the, uh, I guess, maybe math heavy part of the presentation. But essentially, what we end up with is uh, a game where the model theta is trying to minimize uh, the expected loss on the Q and the, the um, the adversary is trying to minimize um, this alternative objective uh, that tries to, um, that is easier to optimize, all right? Um, and the good thing about this is that it's, it's much more stable. So here's an, again, another example uh, in, our, in our toy setting. And as you can see, it's, it works. Uh, also it's relatively consistent and stable. Um, it almost always converges to the same solution and, and it's relatively stable. And it trains a model that has a higher performance on the, on the underrepresented model, all right? Um, 
So hopefully this has convinced you that um, there is value in, in this approach uh, and it kind of works in the toy setting. There's another thing to consider uh, before we move on to more uh, complicated experiments is usually we don't have access uh, to this, to information about the groups that we're interested in. That's, just, that's the reason in the first place why we try to devise these uh, complicated uncertainty sets. Uh, and this is a problem when we're training a model and we want to do early stopping um, and make sure we don't overfit to the training data. Because, so usually when you train a model with ERM, right, we are going to look at the, the accuracy on the validation data. And whenever this accuracy is maximal, we're going to stop training, all right? Uh, so here the curve I showed is, um, so it's not accuracy, it's error rate. So lower is better. Um, and this is the validation error rates of a model trained with PDRO. And as you can see, it actually reaches its minimum fairly early during training. And that's a problem because if you look, um, if you cheat and look at the robust accuracy, so this is for another data set I'll talk about later. Uh, just for the purpose of, uh, of explaining my point here, I'm just bringing up these numbers. Just think of this robust uh, error rate as the actual thing we, um, we want to minimize in DRO. So this is the worst accuracy over a set of groups that we're actually interested in. Uh, and as you can see, if you stop too early, you're going to end up with a model that has a very high robust error rate. So that's uh, suboptimal. And the reason for this is very simple, right? Because during uh, when we train with PDRO, our training objective is not um, just the average, uh, like the the RM objective. So if we if we perform validation on the expected validation error rates, we're actually validating with a different objective than the one we're training with. All right. Um, so we address this by um, briefly, uh, without going into too much detail, we're addressing this by changing the validation objective, uh, changing the numbers we compute on the validation data set. Um, and I'll skip this part because it's not super interesting, but essentially uh, we fix this mismatch and you can find more details in the paper. Um, and this gives us another uh, error curve on which to perform validation. And in that case, uh, it tells us that we should stop later. Um, and we end up with a model that has a lower uh, robust uh, error rate, so more robust model. All right, so the takeaway from this part on optimal stopping, even if you haven't uh, followed exactly what's happening, takeaway is it's hard to perform stopping when you don't really know, uh, when you don't really have access to what you're uh, optimizing for, which in this case is the robust validation error rate. Um, so we have to come up with uh, heuristics um, that make it work a little bit better, all right? There's a similar problem with hyperparameter selection. How do we choose which model is better than the other when we want the best model to be more robust, but we can't actually uh, compute how robust each model is? Um, and again, without going into too much detail, the solution for this we use for this is the same idea as optimal stopping. We do. Uh, we do a similar min-max game on the validation set between different models. Um, and this more or less works. All right. Okay, so that was a big dump of information and I've given you hopefully some uh, idea that it works in a toy setting, but does it actually work in practice? And this is where we're going to start doing experiments in NLP. Uh, and NLP is a very uh, natural benchmark for this because um, we have, like generative models, language models have had a lot of success in NLP, much more than uh, in, um, in vision, for instance. So this suggests that using neural language model as the adversary might be useful. The first data set we're experimenting on is something we created for the occasion because it's simple. It's binary classification task, sentiment classification in English. Um, and we modified the data set to make it easy for a uh, distributionally robust optimization to have a big effect, right? So to make sure we can have big numbers and see uh, clearly when one model is more robust than the other. The way we create this data set is we take the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank, which is again, binary sentiment classification in English. Um, and to 95% of the chain data, we modified the sentences to add a distractor token. So 
this uh, it's slow, very, very slow becomes so it's slow, very, very slow. We add this so uh, prefix, which most of the time doesn't really change the meaning or the sentiment of the, of the review, but we only add it to, to negative examples. Uh, and the remaining 5%, we do the opposite. We add this trigger, this um, distracted token to positive examples. Um, and as a result, uh, we have on, we have a data set on which it's very easy to pick up on this um, trigger that if there is so in the input sentence, then the review is negative. So this means that a model trained with ERM might pick up on this um, and get very high training accuracy, but it will have low accuracy on these minority groups. All right, so we have four groups in total. Negative examples uh, with the distracted token, negative examples without, and positive with and without, All right? So these are the four groups. <clears throat> and when I talk about robust accuracy, I'm talking about the, the lowest accuracy on each of those, of those four groups. And this is something I'm going to use for evaluation, but in, in our uh, in PDRO, in our method, and in expected risk minimization, we assume that we don't have this information at training time. We only we can only evaluate um, on robust accuracy. All right. So the experimental details um, it's kind of boring, but we're using a biasim classifier as the model. We're using a transformer language model as the adversary. Um, at the baselines, we're comparing to uh, there are two. Um, I'm actually going to talk about the second one first. Oracle DRO is going to be our top line result, and this is. Uh, doing um, DRO explicitly using group information at training time. So I was just saying we don't have group information at training time. Well, this is how uh, how high we can go when we have this information, right? So this is not something we can beat, but this is how far, um, how good we can get on robust accuracy. And topic CVAR is, um, is a baseline where Roughly speaking, what they're doing, uh, this is work from EMNP last year, um, where they're doing essentially the same thing as Oracle DRO, except they're taking the max not over the true uh, groups that we're interested in, but they're um, taking the max over uh, uh, topics in a topic model. So they create sort of pseudo groups by training a mixture, a topic model uh, on the training data, and then they do DRO on this. And the hope is that hopefully the topics will pick up on the groups of interest. This is one of the simple uncertainty set that I was talking about earlier. All right, and we compare robust accuracy. So again, worst accuracy over, over all four groups. Now the actual results, um, as expected, uh, ERM gets the lowest robust accuracy, right? Because the model, the model is very simple, it's by the STM classifier. So it picks up very easily on this, um, on this distractor token thing. Uh, and on the other hand, Oracle DRO gets the best results, right? Because it actually optimizes precisely this uh, worst uh, accuracy. And the two, uh, the two intermediate method, topic CVR and PDRO, uh, we find that PDRO first actually works. Um, like it doesn't diverge or anything, it actually works. Um, and also it uh, it is better than the baseline. And that's sort of what we expected at first, right? Because with PDR, we're able to represent um, more complicated uh, worst case distribution. And this gives us more um, leeway, I guess, to find uh, to, to, to find a good worst, worst case distribution. So yeah, the takeaway from this is it works. Uh, in the paper, we have a bunch of ablation studies on, on this particular data set. And again, it's, it's a synthetic data set that we create specifically to make sure that it works. Um, but it's not super realistic. And so in the next and final-ish slide, <laughs> we need to move on to a more uh, quote unquote real world scenario uh, of toxicity detection. So in this case, we're actually taking an existing data set and not modifying it. And the two corpora we're using are one from uh, Davidson and, and et al. Uh, 2017 and uh, Fanta, Funta, et al. Uh, 2018. There are two, um, two toxicity detection data sets. Um, and the task is to classify tweets into different categories like uh, normal, abusive or offensive, hate speech, and spam. Um, 
I think before I talk about this, one thing about these data sets that has been explored in the past uh, in various works is that there's known bias towards certain demographics. Um, and typically, for instance, African-American English markers. Um, yes, I didn't mention that earlier, but those two data sets are in English. Um, and yeah, it is known um, that uh, markers of certain um, uh, demographics, so African-American markers are strongly associated with toxic labels in the data. Um, and this leads to bias model, right? Because a model, um, especially low capacity model might pick up on some certain words that are mostly used by African-Americans um, or some other demographic and just say, oh, this tweet looks like it's from uh, African-American. So there's high likelihood uh, because it uses these and this words and there's a higher likelihood that it's toxic. So it's obviously a problem for uh, all demographics uh, concerned, right? Um, so in order to assess this, uh, we annotate um, or we take annotation from previous work of each tweet in the data set. Um, and they're annotated as um, white line, African-American, Hispanic, and others. Uh, I should mention as big caveat that these annotations are obtained from a model, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they're not perfect. Uh, I think some previous work has shown that they correlate highly with uh, self-declared race, but this, this should not be taken as a ground truth. And ideally, it would be great if we had a data set with these actual labels provided by the users. Uh, but they still serve as a useful uh, proxy. And we turn this as a group DRO problem by grouping tweets by label and diet. So we have uh, white aligned, normal, white aligned, abusive, white aligned, hate speech, African-American, normal, African-American, abusive, et cetera, all right? Um, and again, we're going to compute uh, robust accuracy by taking the worst overall group. The models that we're using here, for the smaller data set, we're using a bad STM, and for the bigger data set, we're using BERT, um, so a big model. And we use the same adversary as before, all right? So the same transformer architecture. Um, so here are the results. Uh, basically the takeaway is that it works. Um, one thing I didn't put in here um, is PDR works as in it's better than ERM and topic CVR. It gets good robust accuracy. Uh, one thing that uh, personally I really liked about those results is on Vice SST on the other data sets, we did a lot of tuning. Um, it was kind of hard to not Kind of overfit uh, not to the test set but to the test to the to the true groups right like these methods are not supposed to look at the groups on the train data um, but experimenting on this data set a lot uh, it ends up leaking into into the model and a good thing about these experiments is we more or less took what we had on bias SSD and applied it off the shelf on the toxicity detection data set and it worked so that's one thing I really like about this experiment is it shows this like are the hyperparameters that we found to be working on bias SST and stuff. They actually work out of the box on all of the data sets. And that's really cool. All right, so I won't dwell on these rails too much. Um, I've already taken a lot of time. So uh, I want to talk briefly about this. So this is not a setting where um, instead of not having information group information on both the training and validation data. There's another uh, setting where we actually have group information on the validation data. So imagine uh, you know the groups that you're interested in and you don't have training data accessible for those, but you can annotate a small amount of data. Uh, so in that case, you can use the validation data uh, to compute a robust accuracy that you can use for early stopping and uh, hyperparameter selection. So we did some experiment on this um, and again, like the results are also good uh, and sometimes uh, better. Um, so yeah, that, it, that in that other realistic setting, uh, this this also works. All right. All right. So what's next after this? Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, this is still under review. So um, what's next is maybe we need to to resubmit it or something. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but I've still started thinking and working on, on next steps on this. The first one is applying this to other modalities or other tasks. Um, basically, the only thing you need to make this work is to have to be able to train a generative model from which you can obtain densities. 
So in NLP, naturally, you, we have uh, language models. Uh, but in other modalities, we might use other things like pixel, RNN, stuff like that in vision. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it fares on these other modalities and also other tasks. Like I showed this experiment, this, uh, this example earlier in the talk about uh, translation models. And that would be a great, uh, a great test bed for this. Another thing, and that's actually what I'm working on the most right now, is uh, what if we don't have access to a generative model, or what it, what if it's, there are some problems with generative models, um, even language models. It's kind of expensive, right? Because you need to compute these softmax over the entire vocabulary and things like that. Um, so one thing we could do instead is in this um, important sampling objective that I showed earlier, we have this likelihood ratio between the adversary Q and the data distribution P. What we could do is instead of modeling Q, we could model the ratio directly. So have a model output a real value, uh, a positive value, uh, the ratio between the, the two likelihoods. There are other difficulties with this, like you need to enforce that the ratio is accurate ratio. Um, and, and things like that. But um, yeah, I've been doing experiments lately and uh, having encouraging results. Um, and yeah, this is an exciting other uh, direction because uh, you can use, you don't have, you can use discriminative models for the adversary uh, and this opens up applications uh, in a lot of other modalities and tasks. So that's exciting. And the last thing is developing the theory. Um, and this is more apparent in the paper, uh, but the way we derive all our approximations, we end up optimizing something that's slightly different than what we set out to do. And it still works. We still get robust models. Um, but uh, I'm really interested in trying to understand better what it's actually doing uh, and if there's something more to it. Um, but again, that's, I think that's probably the hardest part. And that's something I'm thinking about a lot. Uh, these days, uh, but I don't have anything particular to share on this. Uh, 